right, if you would find your place in Nehemiah this morning. Nehemiah, that's the way I pronounce it. Some, uh, I always like to listen to somebody else read the Bible before I stumble through names, and, and they pronounce it Nehemiah, and that's probably the correct way to do it, but it's just easier for me to say Nehemiah, so bear with me on that. But a Nehemiah chapter number one, and so that's in the Old Testament. Uh, you got second, first, uh, first and Second Chronicles, and you got Ezra, and then Nehemiah. And so, uh, as I asked you last week to be prayerful, I, I looking for the direction the Lord would have us to go, and uh, I believe this is it. And so we're going to start this morning a new series, and I've I've named it. It's time to arise. It's time for the church to arise, and so that's what we'll be looking at uh, this morning and kind of give you a little background before we dive into the book of Nehemiah. Uh, So the books of Ezra and Nehemiah were actually written as one book, right? They were together uh, originally, uh, but were later separated out into two books when they were uh, put into the Bible as we have it today, and so they were written around 50 years after the Babylonian exile. So you remember the exile of, uh, of the, the Israelites, uh, of, excuse me, of, uh, yeah, the Israelites, and, and they were taken to Babylon, and so this is around 50 years after that, and so the stories, the two uh, tell basically the story of some Israelites who returned to Jerusalem, and then what happens when they rebuild their lives and the cities, and so the book of Ezra and Nehemiah focus on two characters, excuse me, three characters, uh, that is Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. And so Zerubbabel leads the first group uh, back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. And so they go back and they rebuild the temple, and then about 60 years later, Ezra arrives to Jerusalem uh, to teach the Torah and to rebuild the community that was there in Jerusalem. And then as we get into the book of Nehemiah, Uh, He goes later to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. And so um, I've had this book on my my heart uh, probably since the end of last year and just never could get the confirmation or the peace uh, that it was time to preach it. And and I believe that the Lord has now let me have that. And so, again, we're going to do a study through the book uh, beginning this morning. And, again, just keep that focus in our minds. It's time to arise. Okay, so... Let me go ahead and give my disclaimer. I'm going to get on a soapbox a few times today. I'm not apologizing for it. I'm just letting you know that it's not bashing or meant to offend anyone. But I believe when we preach the Word of God, we've got to preach the Word of God. And so give you a little heads up. Uh, there's some things that I've been praying that God would keep me out of it and just let His Word come forth. And so with that being said... And, and let me say this, too. I'm not being a naysayer this morning. This, is, this sermon is going to end uh, on a good note. And so the beginning, though, is kind of, kind of bad. And so bear with me there. So our nation, America, would you agree, has been and is in decline? I, I would say it has. I, say, I would say it is. But if you go back to the very beginning, our founding forefathers dedicated this nation to Almighty God. So what has happened between then and now? And that's what we're going to look at as we start here in chapter 1 and 2 of Nehemiah. It's, it's almost to the point now to me where the church is now silenced. Right? We were founded upon God, upon uh, the, the beliefs of the Bible, of, of the Christian belief, but now the Christian belief is being silenced. And so the land of the free has become the land of the free as long as you don't say or do anything about God. And so in a sense, the church is experiencing spiritual exile, and this is where it ties into Nehemiah. Okay, so the sad part about it is that we, the church, not this church, but the body of Christ as a whole, is allowing it to happen on our watch, right? It's happening on our watch. And, and so 
what I want to do starting out this morning is find out what Nehemiah did and then apply that to our lives today of what we as the body of Christ need to do to arise and rebuild what has been broken. And so anytime you read a story in the Bible, uh, there's three things that you should consider as you read and study it. And that is, what did it mean then? Okay, so you want to know what the original audience and what the original writer, uh, what was going on? What was that writer saying to the people? And what were the people doing uh, that, that brought about this word of God? And so we want to look at the historical setting, but then you want to look at Okay, what does it mean now? It meant this then. How does it apply now to our day? And then thirdly, what does it mean to me personally? And so we'll start with a historical breakdown of what's happening here. As I've already said, in Nehemiah's time here, the people of God were taken into captivity. They were carried away to a foreign land. And Nehemiah himself is in that foreign land, and he was a government official. And so he was the king's cupbearer, as we'll see in just a moment. And, and we've got to realize what an important role or position being the king's cupbearer was, right? He was trusted by the king, and his purpose of that position was to lighten the king's spirit, but as well as taste the food and the wine uh, that the king was about to eat. And, of course, it was for poison purposes, uh, but a lot of commentaries I re was reading also was to make sure the food tasted good. Uh, they didn't want to set something before the king that, that needed some salt or needed some, some extra seasoning to it or whatever it may be. And so this was Nehemiah's position. And, and to me, in that position as king, you would want somebody you trusted as your cupbearer. You would want somebody who would actually tell you the truth and, you know, tell you what was actually going on. And so this was a, a, a prominent position that he actually held here. And so as Nehemiah is there in the king's court, he meets one of his brethren, as the Bible tells us, who had recently been to Jerusalem. And, and Nehemiah questions. He says, tell me about the fairs of Jerusalem. And so the guy's name is Hanani. Uh, he has bad news for Nehemiah. And so let's just read. Uh, let's just start in verse number one. It says, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, it came to pass in the month of Kislev in the 20th, excuse me, 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Hananiah, one of my brethren, came with me from Judah, and I asked him concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. So we see here these survivors are in great trouble and disgrace. The walls are destroyed. Uh, the gates have been burned down. And with that in mind, we have to ask ourselves, okay, what, what does that mean then? What do walls do, or what are walls for? They're, they're for protection, right, to keep the enemy out. Uh, therefore, separation, therefore, conservation and identification, right? You know your boundaries through the walls. You, you can serve what's inside through your walls. You're separate from the rest of the, the land through your walls. And then what about gates? What are gates for? Of course, we know that gates allow you to come in and go out of the walls. And so gates, in this sense, speaks of freedom and liberty, uh, you're free to come and go as you please, but those gates can be closed to fill in those gaps in the wall uh, to strengthen and to protect uh, what's inside. And so in the Bible, I found this interesting in studying. Uh, the Bible, uh, the gates refer to the glory of God. The, the gates of the city of Jerusalem refer to God's glory. And so in the book of Psalms, uh, you'll find where the psalmist references the gates of the golden city because those gates were symbolic of the glory of God. And, and so now you have here in Nehemiah's time that these walls have been crumbled, the gates have been burned, the streets are filled with, with trash and weed. I can only imagine the weeds that's not been taken care of. Uh, the people were, 
were in despair, they were in great trouble. And so that's how we see the picture of Nehemiah and the people in Jerusalem of this time. And so then we ask our second question, okay, well, well how does this apply to us today? We don't have walls around our town. We don't, we don't have gates and things like that. When we look at it, walls of protection are broken down, and it's open warfare on Christians today because we have let the gates of the church and the gates of our own hearts become in ruin, right? Just like they were in Nehemiah's time, we've allowed our gates and our walls of our Christian faith to be attacked and to be destroyed. And so without walls of protection and separation, our freedoms and our truths and our, our spirituality are being taken away from us. And the devil has the freedom to come and go as he pleases. And so the walls of the church have been broken down and the glory of God is in ashes. And that's where we are today. If you think about our nation, if we think about our churches, if you think about uh, Christians today, this is kind of where we're at. We're, we've let down the guard. We've let our walls deteriorate. We've, we've let the weeds cr creep up in our lives. And so the devil has freedom to do as he pleases. And so then our third question, well, how does this apply to me personally? What, what am I supposed to do with that, preacher? Well, I want to give you three things that Nehemiah did as we look at how we can arise and rebuild the walls in our own personal lives. And so three things that Nehemiah did. And the first one is Nehemiah visualized the problem, right? In verses one through three there, as we just read, he visualized the problem. And one of the commentaries I read this week, uh, he said this, a Christian is not a negativist, a pessimist, nor a dewy-eyed optimist. He is a realist who must visualize and see the situation as it is. And so we must visualize the problem. Well, what is the problem? Looking at Nehemiah's problem of the walls being uh, broken down and the gates being destroyed, let's look at that in our time, how this applies to us today. So walls of defense have crumbled. Remember, the walls are for protection. But in our churches and many times in our own lives, our wall of defense has fallen as well. We get selfish. We get complacent. We get apathetic. And we let down our guard. And if you give the devil an inch, what does he take? A mile, right? And so we've let down those walls of defense. We've gotten off guard. We've become complacent of where we're at and, and just apathetic. And so then the domestic walls have crumbled. The home is in serious trouble. And you say, well, what does that matter? Well, God instituted the home. Last night in my prayer time, I was, I was praying and the, just some things that are going on. And, and, and you know, you kind of get aggravated at your kids. I don't know if y'all ever do, but sometimes I get aggravated at my kids. And I was praying about it that God would help me to just see it as he would see it. And I began to think, you know, what if God looked at me and said, well, that knucklehead, now what is he doing? But that's the family unit here symbolizes the family unit of God, God the Father and we his children. So the home is so important. And I believe our homes are in serious trouble. Marriage is no longer important. Kids are being left to wander the streets. And, you know, I was thinking this morning growing up, I can't tell you how many miles I put on my bicycle going to my friend's house, right? And it wasn't that my parents didn't care and they just said, get out of here. It was they knew where I was going, what I was doing. I knew what time I needed to be back and check in and all that. Uh, but if you go now where Dallas and Caitlin live, I'll just put it plain and honest. That's one of the problems they have with where they live is the kids just roam the streets at all hours of the night and tear stuff up. And so parents just allow that. Or I think even worse than that is uh, we've gotten a new babysitter in our families, and it's about this big, or sometimes it's really big, and it's electronic, right? We let the, the electronics babysit our kids, and the problem with that is the violence and the filth that, that spews out of those things. And we just hand it to our kids and say, here, watch this so I don't have to worry about it. And so because these walls have fallen, 
Satan has fired every bit of his artillery at the home. And then thirdly, our walls of decency have decayed. This is where I'm probably going to get on a soapbox. I'm going to try to stay off of it, hold myself down. It's nothing to see men and women on TV, in books, in magazines, or even in Walmart, on the streets, wherever it may be, with little left to the imagination. I mean, I'm like, come on, seriously. I was reading a sermon on Nehemiah from 1978, and this particular pastor was talking about the troubles of pornography in that time and how that it was a million-dollar industry. And so my mind of curiosity began to wonder, and I carefully Googled the pornography industry's net worth now in our day. This is going to blow your mind. Maybe not, but I, the pornography industry generates between $15 billion and $97 billion a year. So if you break that down, that's $3,000 every second. And it gets easier and easier every day to access it. I was playing a game on my phone this week. I have ADD, ADHD, whatever you call it. And so sitting and waiting is terrible. I hate it. And so I get these puzzle games where your mind's got to work and you do these puzzles. And, and this particular one, you, you got all these cars in a parking lot and you got to get them all out. And so every two levels, you have to watch an advertisement. Well, this, this advertisement pops up, and it's two uh, cartoon character females, and they're in a sexual situation. And, and the point of the game is you've got to decide what you want them to do. And I'm like, Whoa, what is this? And I'm trying to hide my phone. I don't want somebody to think, what's that pervert doing? Uh, and this is just on an advertisement. And so the problem is this is a game that we would hand our kids to keep them quiet. And this advertisement would pop up. And so... We've lost our decency. We've got a whole month dedicated to homosexuality. We've got transgenders reading kids' books in libraries. But heaven forbid the Gideons go up and down the halls and hand out Bibles, right? Our decency is gone. There is no decency anymore. We were in Walmart here a while back. I probably shouldn't tell this. Bryson will get mad at me. But we're walking through the parking lot of Walmart, and he says, Ooh, Dad, you can see her butt. And he wasn't lying. And I was like, Good grief. There is no decency. Our walls of doctrine have fallen down. So I believe this one is, is what results to the other walls falling down. We've, we've let our walls of doctrine fall. What is doctrine? That's what we believe about the Bible, what we believe about God, right? So... The modern gospel, and I say gospel loosely, the modern gospel tells us that you can believe whatever you want as long as you believe something, right? You can believe that God's a woman and his, Jesus is a gardener. I don't know. As long as you believe something, then everything's okay. But that's not what the Word of God tells us. We believe the doctrine of this book. This is God's instructions to us. And so we've got to realize that what this Bible says to do, we need to do. And what it says not to do, we need not to do. All right? We need to let God call sin, sin, and no questions asked. And so God's promises are true, and, and that's what the people of God learned here in the book of Nehemiah as we continue our study through this, through this book. The walls had come down. And as a result, God's people were defeated. They were living in survival mode instead of revival mode. And so we've let our walls down as Christians, as the church. And we've been taken captive by the enemy. And uh, I hope that you can see that. And if not, I, I pray that God would open your eyes and let you see it, that the walls have decayed, the, the gates are burned, and and the first thing that Nehemiah did was he visualized the problem. He saw it as it was. He didn't try to sugarcoat it. He didn't say, well, they can do what they want to over there. It's okay. We'll just do what we want over here. Oh, no, he, he visualized the problem, and that led to the next thing that he did. It broke his heart. And so, secondly, Nehemiah agonized 
in prayer. And so it's not enough to see the ruins, but we need to weep over them as Nehemiah did. Now, looking at his prayer here in verses 4 through 11, what kind of prayer did Nehemiah pray? And I believe there's four elements of this prayer that we can look at this morning and, and put that into practice in our own lives. Uh, the first one is it was a prayer of contrition. A prayer of contrition. Look at verse number 4. So, I, so it was, excuse me, when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days, I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. You know what's wrong with many Christians today? And, and I'm one of the many Christians today, okay? One of the things that is one of our biggest problems, I would say, is that we're more interested in NFL or MLB or going on vacation or, or, or golfing or fishing or, or hunting or whatever it may be, whatever it may be. Not that those things are bad, but we get more focused on those things than we do the things of God. I know people, and it's nobody in the church here, don't worry. I know some people that can tell you stats to every basketball, baseball, football, hockey, soccer. I mean, they can just rattle this stuff out. And I'm like, how do you know that? Why do you know that? Because I'm not a sports fan, but how do you know that? We should be able to rattle off the Bible and the truths of God just like that in the same way, right? So we as the church have forgotten how to weep. The prophet Jeremiah, he was known as the weeping prophet, right? He prayed, he, the sins of Israel broke his heart and he, he wept for their repentance. Nehemiah here, he wept over the people of his day. Remember when Jesus made the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept. And so the things that break the heart of God ought to break our hearts. And to put that personally, when's the last time we wept? over a lost soul when's the last time we wept over this community or this this city whatever uh, stayed when's the last time you wept for the things of god i suggest that it's time for the church to weep i believe our town is worth weeping over i believe our nation is worth weeping over the lost souls of men and women is worth weeping over the glory of god that's being trampled is worth weeping over and if we're not moved to tears then i suggest we get along with god and we pray and say god break my heart for what breaks yours it was a prayer of contrition and then secondly it was a prayer of confession and not only was it a prayer of confession uh but excuse me i got ahead of myself not only was it a prayer of contrition but it was also a prayer of confession and look at verses five and seven Verse 5 says, And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those you love, who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open so that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night. For the children of Israel, your servants, are con and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinance which you commanded your servant Moses. And so notice it's a twofold confession there. It's a prayer that confesses the national sin, but then Nehemiah goes into that personal confession of his own sins. And I think too often we're good at confessing the sins of others, but somehow we we fail to mention our own sins. 2 Corinthians 7, 14, one of those verses that we love to quote, <clears throat> excuse me, it says this, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. We've heard that verse before, right? Do we catch, though, that what he says is, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves? That's personal. 
That's our own sins. It's not just praying for the sins of the nation, but he's saying if my people will confess their sins, pray and seek my face, then I'll turn and forgive their sins and heal their land. And so revival of our churches must begin with repentance. Repentance must begin with confession. And so it was a prayer of confession. And then third, it was a prayer of confidence. Look at verses 8 and 9 with me. It says, remember, I pray the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest parts of heaven, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as my dwelling for my name. And so here's a prayer that's based on the promise of God. And let me say it's all true prayer should be based on the word of God and the promises of God. And that's why prayer and Bible study go hand in hand. Our prayer should be the word of God. And, and so uh, Nehemiah is reminding here God of what he had told Moses. Not that God needed reminding, know that, but that our prayer should be based on the words of God. Now, if your Bible has footnotes like mine does, verse 8 will point you to Leviticus chapter 26, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4 and Deuteronomy chapter 28. And so those are those promises that God made to Moses that Nehemiah is now praying or referencing in his prayer. And so we, we see that our prayer should be in confidence of the promises of God. And so we can pray that God's word is true. And so we can't say there's no hope for the church today. We can't say there's no hope for our nation today because God tells us that if we repent and pray and turn to him, then he will answer our prayers. And so think about it in Nehemiah's day. The walls are crumbled, the streets filled with trash, the gates are burned, the people are in despair. But Nehemiah got the city on his heart. He visualized, and then he agonized in prayer. And we see later on God move. And so then fourthly, uh, we've got a prayer of contrition, a prayer of confession, a prayer of confidence. And then it was a prayer of commitment. Now look at verse number 11 with me. <coughs> Excuse me. O oh Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayers of your servant and to the prayers of your servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king cupbearer. Now why does he throw that in there at the end? Well, as I already said, Nehemiah had a good job, a great job actually. And so in this last part of the prayer, we see his commitment to God. He's saying, God, I'm willing to give up my position to be used by you to go and do as you would have me to do. And so he's about to ask the king for permission to go to Jerusalem and restore the walls. He wasn't content to just see the ruins and to weep. But he was committed to putting his prayers into action. And so he's praying, God, what I'm about to do is give up my job. I'm actually going in here in front of this king who could probably cut my head off just for coming to ask him to go and do what you've asked me to do. And so we see this commitment. And then thirdly, we see that Nehemiah organized. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, we read that. And I'm not going to read all the verses. I see I'm getting close on time. Uh, but... This is the, the final thing that we see that he did. He visualized, he agonized, then he organized. Now James wrote in James chapter 2, verse 17, that faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So what does that mean? Well, that means this is where the rubber hits the road, okay? It's one thing to say that you've got faith, but are you actually doing it? It's one thing for Nehemiah to see the problem and to agonize over the problem, but he did something about it. He organized. He got ready to go. And so uh, there's three points here I want to go through. Uh, three things that Nehemiah needed to rebuild the walls. And then to put that in our own personal aspect, three things that we need today if we're going to start rebuilding our own walls. The first one is Nehemiah needed the king's permission. Verses 1 through 4 tell about the king seeing Nehemiah sad, and he says, well, you know, what's the problem? And Nehemiah tells him 
that his homeland is in ruins. And then verse 5, Nehemiah asked for permission to go and restore the walls of Jerusalem. And what I get out of this is before we go out and do any work or witnessing for the Lord, we must first ask his permission. <coughs> Excuse me, and you say, no, wait a minute, preacher. If I'm going to do the Lord's work, do I really have to ask permission to do it? If you want his authority, yes. Right? If you want God's authority, then we need to ask him for his permission. Right? So this morning, would you ask God for his blessing, his, his hand on you that you might have the king's permission to be used for the kingdom of God? Would you be willing in your heart to say, God, can you use me? God, will you use me for your kingdom? So he needed the king's permission. Secondly, he needed the king's protection. Look at verse number 7 there. This is chapter 2, verse 7. Furthermore, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river that they must permit me to pass through Till I come to Judah. So Nehemiah here is about to go through some hostile territory. And he knows it. He knows he could be in danger. And so he asked the king for royal documents that guarantee his safe passage. This world is not our home. Right? We're just pilgrims passing through. There's an old hymn that, that goes along those lines. And if I had a singing voice, boy, I'd sing it to you right now. But I don't, so let's keep going. Right? We're just pilgrims passing through. And sometimes as we go through this life, we go through hostile territories on our journeys. But God not only gives us his permission, he gives us his protection to see us through. And here's the thing we've got to remember, right? Nothing can come to me unless it comes through God and he allows it for my good and for his glory. And so we ask for the protecting hand of God. Sometimes things happen and we say, oh, God, are you not protecting me? But maybe it's for his glory and our good. So we ask for that protection. And then thirdly, we need the king's provision. Look at verse number 8. And he's continuing on, he's asking for this letter, and he says, And also I need a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gate of the citadel, which pertains to the temple, for the city wall, and for the house that I will occupy. Now, God's work is never stopped because of insufficient funds. Insufficient faith, yeah. Insufficient commitment, yeah. In, insufficient obedience, oh yeah, but never because of insufficient funds. And so if we're willing to be obedient, he will make the way. I mean, here God uses a pagan king, right? This is the king of Persia, the enemy. And God is using him. We'll read that. Keep reading in verse number uh, whatever we were at, 8. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. God gets the glory there. God used, and boy, I wish I could say that name. Does anybody know the king? Can anybody say the king's name? That's how I would say it. I didn't know if it was right or not. Artaxerxes, maybe. I don't know. God used this king, this pagan king, to fund the building of the walls and the gates, the rebuilding. And so... If we're willing and obedient, he makes a way. So when we line up with God, God lines up all of the universe behind his people to provide protection, to provide provisions if we go through his permission. And so God brought us here today to hear this message. And, and it's not what I've said, but what he says. And so I'm asking you this morning to ask God, God, what do you want to do in my heart and my life? As we go through this study of looking at rebuilding, of, of arising, my hope is that we would all leave this saying, God, what do you want to do in my heart? What do you want to do in my life? 
I, I want to see revival start right here in Fort Smith. John and I have talked about this uh, several times. Just revival start right here, and man, just spread like fire. And, and that's what he and I have talked about. All the people from all over the United States descend on this little town, this little place that nobody knows of in the summer. What if that revival broke out and these people's hearts became inflamed with God and they went back home and they spread the gospel? And Could you imagine the gospel impact that that could have if that revival broke out? So I pray that we see a revival start right here in this community. And I personally, I want to start rebuilding walls that I've let crumble. Some walls that I've let decay in my life, and I want to block the enemy from coming and going as he pleases, and I know that has to start right here in my own heart. And so may we this morning visualize the problem, may we agonize in prayer over the problem, and then may we all organize to rectify the problem through the king's permission, through his protection, and through his provision. So Heavenly Father, God, again, I come before you. God, I thank you for giving me the liberty to preach this message this morning. And, and God, what a, what a great study I've had in it so far. And God, just seeing there's places in my life, God, that I've become lax, I've become lazy, I've become complacent. God, there's some things that you tell us to stand on that I believe it's time for us as a church to stand on, God. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to see as we go through this study that you call this men and women for a purpose. And God, may you call this church to begin rebuilding walls and restoring gates. God, that we would stand in the gap. And God, that you would use this little community as a starting place, God, for something great. That you would birth out a revival right here in our land, God. That you would start within each one of our hearts, God, and rekindle the fire. God, stoke the coals and and Lord, just pray that you would ignite in us a burning desire for you and for your word, God, and that we would spread that word throughout this land. God, thank you so much that as we come to you and ask your permission to go forth, that you do offer your hand of protection and you offer your hand of provisions to us. God, I just pray that you would help us to see that as we go forth from this day. God, that we'll come back next week eager to hear more about the story of Nehemiah. It is in the name of Jesus I do pray and ask these things. Amen.